Hallelujah, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Let's sing it out in this place. You are holy. Hallelujah. in this place and you are holy oh so holy you are holy Lord of all Lord of all Let's give him praise in this place. Father, we worship you, God. We praise you, God. We glorify your name, God. Oh, we worship you. Father, we worship you. We're going to open our service in prayer. How many of you know God hears the prayers of his people? When we get together and we lift up our voice, God hears everything you and I say, whether it's vocally or in our hearts. And God knows every need that is in this place. Maybe you forgot to write down your need here in, uh, to, the, uh, to my right on the media. You can write your, uh, your prayer list there. There's areas in our foyer. You can write your need there, but maybe you forgot that it's all right. As you're, as you're in this place, just simply lift up your hand. God, I have a need. I am here before your presence. I know you hear me, and I know you are faithful to answer. We also want to lift up the needs that are behind me on the screen, needs of salvation, needs of healing. We want to lift up our brother Hans, that God would do a complete healing in his body. We also want to lift up Jose Ramirez, for uh, he is battling COVID. We want to pray for that need. We want to pray that God touches this man and brings complete healing. We serve Jehovah Rapha, my God, my healer. And tonight, we want to lift up our voice by faith, believing that God is going to move. As we subside, uh, if our brother Noe can come up and pray, let us also pray for our baby churches in Eloy, Bakersfield, and also Maricopa. We want to pray also for our missionary work that is in Michoacan. We want to pray that God moves supernaturally, that in these last days, he brings a revival that is supernatural. People would be getting saved and backsliders will return back to the house of God. So at this time, let's lift up our voice. Whatever need that you have, lift it, lift it up to the throne of, of heaven. And as we subside, our brother Noe is going to take us before the throne of God. Let's pray in this place. Father, we worship you. God, we praise you. We glorify your name. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. God, I pray for Hans for a complete healing in his body. God, touch him. Bring resurrection, life, and power. God, I pray, God, for our church service tonight that you would speak into our lives. God, I pray pour out the Holy Spirit, God. Speak to us. Help us, God, to serve you. I pray fill your people with the Holy Ghost, God, in these last days, God. Save, God, those that are unsaved. Bring back the backslider, God. Father God, we just thank you, God, for giving us this chance to come before you tonight, God. I just pray that you just establish your presence here, God. I pray, God, for our that for our pioneer works, God, the church in Eloy, Pastor Gordon, and Pastor Humberto, and Gloria, and for Samora, was Pastor Jacob. God, that you just continue to move, Father God. I pray, God, for our pastor as he is away right now, God, preaching a revival, that you would just bless him, God, and the church he is at. I pray for our own church, God, and your word that will be spoken to us tonight, God, that you would just move, God, that you just speak unto us.
to us, God. We just thank you, God, for giving us this chance to come before you. We just ask you that you would just continue to move in Casa Grande and all around the world. I pray for our brother Hans Smith, God, that you just that you just supernaturally heal him, God. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's worship God. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Before you turn around and welcome somebody, don't forget to pray for our pastor as he's away in revival, that God will use him powerfully as he is ministering. Now you can welcome somebody that's next to you. God bless every single one of you that is here in this place as we find our seats. Before we carry on with our service, we just want to make you aware of some of the announcements that are happening in this place. There is food after the service. Oh, I got your attention. <laughs> All right, now that I got your attention. I want to make you aware of some of the announcements that we have this week. So as on Sundays, we have our uh, adult Bible study at 930. We are doing memorial stones with uh, Pastor Greg. I encourage you to come and hear the history of our fellowship, how everything started. Uh, through that, you can gain understanding of how everything has come to be established, why we do what we do. And... Uh, you will grow in that knowledge. Then after that, 1030, we have our morning service. In the evening on Sunday, we have at 5 o'clock our uh, new converts class that is headed up by Ralph and his wife. It's called Starting Point. If you have been saved six months and under, I encourage you come to this, uh, to this class to hear on the foundations of faith. That way you can grow and mature in your salvation after that, we have prayer at what time? 5.30. That's right. 5.30, we have prayer. I encourage you, come to prayer. Prayer is a very, very vital part of your salvation. It's your communication with God. That's how it's your communication with the living God. Think about that. You and I can come, whether it's at home in a closet, whether it's here at church, and you can talk to the God that created everything. You can come before his presence and bring every single need that is in your life. Amen. That is great hope right there for the, for the Christian. That we can pray to the living God. 530 is prayer. Let us gather together. Bring to God the service that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would come down in the service. 630 we have our evening service on Sunday. And then on Monday... There is going to be, uh, it's uh, the 11th, there is a Prescott Men's Discipleship. We are meeting here at 5 o'clock, and then uh, that way we can shoot out and be there early. Uh, Live Again will be taking place at uh, 7 o'clock on Monday with our brother Sam and his wife Yvette. Uh, it's it's an addiction-based ministry. Again, we've heard addiction is not only just drugs. I know we hear addiction, and we... That's what we focus on, just drugs. But addiction can be anything. You can be an addict to anything, even to coffee. Amen. You can be an addict to coffee. Coffee can be an addiction. I will be the first to tell you I am an addict to uh, coffee. I'll, sure, I'll tell you, okay? I'm not in the closet anymore. I'm telling you I am an addict, okay? Again. Addiction can be in anything. Our brother Sam, you need any any other information, just talk to them. Six o'clock and then seven o'clock. Uh, aren't you glad this is not a test? Seven o'clock is our service. Uh, but on Sunday, the 10th, there is donuts and discipleship. Uh, right before we do our Sunday morning Bible study, that is at 7.30 in the morning. All men, I encourage you, come gather together with other men. And we can there ask questions and grow as a disciple. Uh, Saturday, 
uh, the 9th. I want to remind you in the morning, 9 o'clock, there is prayer. Come gather to, uh, together with us. Pray, get a hold of God before we start our morning. And then uh, 5.30 p.m., we are going to go help our brother in Eloy. He is preparing for the light parade that is there. That is at 6 o'clock. But we want to make sure that we leave here by 530 so we can be there on time and help our brother with everything that he has there that is going on. And we want just want to be a blessing to our brother and help him as he is doing the work of God in Eloy, because we want to see that church grow. Man, we want to see what God has for that church and also for the other baby churches, I believe. Uh, looking ahead also next uh, the Saturday after the 16th. Uh, again, Saturday morning prayer, there's outreach. And then at 7 p.m., there's an ugly sweater party. Uh, if you have any questions, I will direct you to Mrs. Halley. Sure. Okay. Mrs. Halley would have all the answers to your questions. She can help and direct you on that. Uh, amen. I think that is all the announcements. Let's give God praise as the ushers come to the front. Father, we worship you, God. We praise and glorify your name god we thank you for your goodness very quickly i just want to share a testimony just recently i saw the provision of god over somebody's life there's a man that was uh, going through some tough times he was struggling uh the friday that we were going to leave to the rally i was here in prayer in the morning and this man was with me and uh he was going through some hard times so he uh, calls uh, family members, he calls for help, and one person was able to direct them to a certain place. He speaks to them, he tells them, go to this place, you tell them, uh, speak to this certain person, you let them know that you talk to me, I work with them, they know me, and they'll be able to help you. So right after that call, I, I, I told my brother, I said, let's go, I'll give you a ride. So we went down to TLCR as we're talking to the person that we were referred to, she takes us into the office. We sit down. We're talking to her. She starts asking questions, her whole procedure. And at the end, she says, you know what? Uh, I can't get this man a place till Monday at 530. And we're like, all right. So as I'm sitting there, I'm praying. I ask God, God, if you can do a miracle for me, which he has, then you can do that for him. She gets a phone call. She gets on. She's on the phone talking to this person. She gets on her computer, and I see this like it looks like an Excel sheet. The reason she couldn't get this uh, place for this person is because there's a person that was pending for a room. So, as she's talking on the phone, she takes this person's name, the brother that was here, from the bottom of the list, takes it all the way to the second uh, part of the list, erases the other name. Hangs up the phone, turns around and says, I just worked my magic. I got a place for you today. How many know that is only God can do? That is a miracle. That is a miracle only God can do in our lives. But that testimony is not just for that brother. That testimony is for you also. Because the Bible talks about faith. Faith is what moves God. There is many, many examples in the Bible of works of God because of faith. Because people put their trust on the living God, the God who created heaven and earth and can do anything and everything. The Bible asks the question, is there any, anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is simply no. God can do anything. He can bring a coin out of the fish's mouth. He can provide for 4,000 and 5,000 people out of simple resources, but it's all through faith. You're in this place. You found, find yourself in a difficult situation in life. I'm telling you, the God of heaven can do a miracle for you, but it's when we step out in faith. This place right now, this place of offering, is a place of moving in faith. Will you believe the living God in this time? for a great, great miracle. Because the answer is God can move as you make that step of faith. Let's bow our heads in this place. Let's close our eyes. Let's remember the many forms of giving that are behind me on the screen. Let's remember our tithes and our offerings. 
aside and uh, all the needs that are before us. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, if our brother uh, Louis, can you pray over the offering? Amen. God bless you as you give tonight. Test. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me once more. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Amen. God is good. God is good. Amen. Uh, tonight, we are going to be watching a video. It comes from the Española New Mexico congregation. It is evangelist uh, John Perry. And uh, it is called Hope in a Hopeless World. Bear with us as we get the uh, video ready. morning and uh, I really appreciate the invitation to be able to come here to Española. I've had over the years uh, a few opportunities to uh, be able to preach and do revivals in a uh, small U.S. I guess we're in the southwest here is that right? It's part of the southwest yeah small south towns and I like them and uh, this is a similar environment from uh, where I was saved, where I come from. Uh, the only difference being that where I was saved wasn't desert as it is here. But I love your state here. And there sure is a whole lot going on here that is uh, that you can feel good about in New Mexico. And I think I could live here and be a New Mexican without too many problems. God bless you this morning. I'm glad you've come. If you have a Bible with you, we're going to run through a number of chapters of uh, the book of Genesis this morning. Genesis 25, we want to begin reading in verse 31. We're going to actually uh, read three different texts. And towards the end of my sermon this morning, we're going to look at a fourth uh, uh, text. The first thing I want to say to you is the fact that God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And it's easy for us to get to the place once we've been saved for a few years. We uh, are a disciple-making fellowship. We are a church. For us to lose sight of the fact or just uh, no longer be cognizant of the fact that God actually loves us and that God has a plan for us and wants to help us and bless us. But what God does in your life is going to be intimately connected to the words that you speak. So this morning, I want to challenge you with a few thoughts. I'll say to you this morning, I wonder if it would change the way you talk if you realized that you would get everything you said. Now think about that for a minute. That everything that came out of your mouth, you would get it. Would it change the way you talk? President Calvin Coolidge, one of your former presidents, 
was famous, famously known as a man of few words. His nickname was Silent Cal. You can look it up if you like later. Don't do it now. And his wife tells the story of how President Coolidge sat next to a young woman uh, at a dinner party one night. And as she was sitting next to the president, she told Coolidge that she had a bet with a friend that she could get him to speak at least three words uh, during the night uh, in their conversation. Without even looking up from his dinner, he responded with the words, you lose. They were the last words that he spoke that night. Coolidge understood very well the value of using only a few carefully considered words. Words are powerful. They are more than meaningless expressions of the mind or the heart. And the Bible gives us the understanding that words have a spiritual effect, that they influence our lives and the lives of others around us. We are going to turn to a very powerful example this morning of words in Scripture and the impact that they have on our lives. We're going to consider Jacob and Esau. And to understand how powerful words are, we need to follow the story through several chapters of the book of Genesis. I'm going to cherry certain portions so that we can get a good idea of what's going on. And what we see playing out is the potent reality of the power and the influence that words have in and through our lives. We need to guard and we need to consider our words carefully because they live beyond the moment when we speak them. Think about that. The words you spoke 10 years ago could still have a life this morning. That they could still be carrying influence and having impact this morning. So I want to minister to you a sermon that I've called, What You Say Is What You Get. I think most of us are probably already aware of the story of Esau selling his birthright to Jacob. So let's recap, first of all, this morning. Esau comes in from hunting. He's hungry. And Jacob convinces him to sell his birthright for a bowl of beans. Genesis 25, beginning verse 31, where the Bible says these words. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now we're going to turn to Genesis 27, 26. And in this next scene, Jacob tricks his father Isaac into bestowing the blessing of the firstborn upon him instead of Esau. Genesis 27, 26. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of man is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed Be those who bless you. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. 
And then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate of it before you came. And listen to what he says here. And I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. Genesis 28, beginning of verse 1 is the third scene where Isaac, Jacob's father, sends him away to his uncle Laban's house. The Bible says, Then Isaac called Jacob, and this is essentially a that Isaac is pronouncing upon his son Jacob, and blessed him and charged him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, Arise and go to to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there, the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. As I said, there's also a fourth scene. We'll come back to that towards the end of this sermon this morning. I want you to think with me to begin with about the power of words. We often fail to understand the power of words. And if this story reveals one thing to us above all else. It's the fact that words have real power. I'm sure that most of you this morning, if you are a student of the Bible, you are familiar with Proverbs 18.21, which says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The Amplified Translation It sheds even more light upon this verse because it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. This one statement makes it clear just how powerful words really are. The Bible says that death and life are determined by them. But even more than this... The Bible encompasses creation in the power of words. Words have incredible creative power. I have often said, and I'll say it again this morning, absolutely believed in the Big Bang. How many of you know what the Big Bang is? Nobody. I know that Espanol is a ways out, but I'm sure that the Big Bang has reached your ears. We know about that, that everything started from nothing. It started from a big bang. Well, I believe in the big bang. I believe God said, let there be stars, let there be a sun, let there be a world, let there be heaven and earth, let there be seas, rivers and trees and animals and birds, and bang, it was there. That's the real big bang. The other one is bogus, of course. And we read in the chapter of faith, which is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, where the Bible says, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. In other words, by His Word. Mere words caused explosive processes to ignite, and at the end of it, worlds, stars, and a universe all existed. But words play out in everyday life also. Consider the setting of our story this morning, which is everyday life. Jacob convinces Esau, his brother, to sell the birthright to him simply through words. Chapter 25, verse 33, then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. By just speaking, Esau surrendered and gave up something very, very valuable, his birthright, which was a powerful privilege and the right of the firstborn. And then again, sometime after this, Jacob tricked his father 
into giving the blessing that rightfully belonged to Esau to him instead. Just words and words that he thought that he was speaking over Esau. But those words were spoken to Jacob and Isaac understood the power of his words. And in chapter 27, 33, the Bible says that Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, I have blessed him and indeed he shall be blessed. But he was speaking to the wrong guy. Isaac said he will be blessed. We really don't understand just how powerful words can be and how much they can affect and influence our lives and the lives of others. If you've ever read a legal contract, you'll understand that they make for very, very boring reading. Is that right? Maybe you've signed up for an app lately. If you sign up for an app, uh, generally speaking, what you have to do, if it's your phone, if it's a, some kind of an app for your computer, what you have to do is you have to agree to the terms and conditions. And what they'll have is they'll have a link to those terms and conditions. How many of you have ever read through those terms and conditions? Oh, really? You agreed to them. You didn't read them? No, of course not. Reading. And they don't mean anything to it. If you're having trouble getting to sleep, if you suffer with insomnia, there's two things you can do. Maybe you can drink less coffee. And the second thing that you might want to do is keep a nice, big, thick legal contract by your bed. Just start reading a few pages. I can guarantee two or three pages in, you'll be sound asleep. It makes very dull and boring reading. But if those same words are brought into a court of law, then all of a sudden they become very powerful because they can cause property to change hands. They can cause rights to be upheld or struck down. They can cause people to lose their freedom and everything they've worked for. They can send people to prison and they can even send people to their death. You know, a few years ago when I was on the Israel trip, I was talking to a pastor. I just met him there, nice guy. And he was an assistant pastor at the time in one of our bigger churches. And he was telling me about his past. He was telling me that he worked in setting up large corporations so they fulfill very, very large contracts. And he would be responsible for uh, leasing or even buying warehouses and all of the logistics, uh, uh, the distribution of goods, uh, uh, all of the plant that was needed to produce goods uh, and hiring people was also one of his responsibilities. And he said to me, he said, sometimes uh, I would have to hire or fire thousands of people. And he was telling me about one instance in which he was required to hire many, many hundreds of people. And he came across a federal requirement that said, if you're going to hire people for this contract, then you have to have a certain percentage of your employees who are disabled. He took that to the CEO. The CEO said, don't you worry about that. You leave that up to me. And the inevitable happened. They were audited as a corporation. And uh, the federal government came along and said, why haven't you uh, honoured this, uh, this requirement? And the CEO said, that's not me, that's this man. And he pointed to our pastor. And our pastor was charged, he was convicted, and he spent nearly three years in prison. Just words. No big deal. Just words. But just words go beyond even that. Because words can make an eternal difference. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God 
unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The gospel, words, just words, but they have the power to save your soul from eternal judgment. It is through mere words accompanied with faith that results in salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The simple truth is, is that if we are the children of God, it will be revealed in our words. Your words this morning are having a powerful. The disturbing question that we have to address here is what about my words? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. If words are powerful, then the issue of our own words are vitally important because it, it means that, that my words are having an effect one way or the other. You can't ignore the impact of your own words on yourself or others. Words are powerful because they are a revelation or, if you like, a revealing of what's really happening inside of your heart. Your words Speak about what you really are on the inside is what Jesus has to say. In Luke 6, 45, he says, what you say flows out of your heart. Have you ever said something? And the moment you said it, you thought, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. Bring those words back. If only we could. You can't. There are many words I wish I could have brought back. It would have changed life. Relationships could have been healed or helped. But words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 19 says, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Words are powerful. We use them without even thinking. But within them lay the power to bless or to curse. Jesus says, in fact, that words are so powerful that ultimately you're going to be judged by them. Matthew 20, uh, 12, 37. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Blessing of the birthright was a blessing of words, but Esau spoke the words and lost not just the words, but the blessing that could have been his. Just words. Now, I want you to think about this idea of being blessed but empty handed. Have any of you ever felt like that? I'm sure that Pastor Tim speaks a lot about the blessing of God. I'm sure you hear it at offering times. I'm sure that he's preached sermons uh, on blessing and believing God. We call it redemption and lift, right? In other words, that's just a, that's just a cr Christianese, if you like. For when you get saved, there is a lift that comes to your life, a blessing that accompanies salvation. Do we believe that this morning? I certainly do. But have you ever felt... That even though I've heard all this stuff, I've heard that God will bless me, I'm empty-handed. Of course, none of you want to raise your hand because we don't want to be embarrassed. But I'm sure that sometimes you've felt like that. Well, I'm blessed, but I'm empty-handed. The power of words is not always immediately recognizable. We often underestimate the power of words because we don't see an immediate effect. But that doesn't mean that their power is not real and effective. You might not see the immediate effect and power of words, but don't discount them. Now, when my wife and I got saved, that was a few years ago now, 
we were living on a farm. It was actually my in-laws' farm, a couple of hundred acres, as I said, down in the southwest. And uh, in that farming community, there were a number of Christians that lived around us. They were real Christians. They were the they were the real deal. And they would drop by from time to time to witness to my wife and I. Now, when they would do this, I would kind of shine them on and I would mock them. It was it was friendly enough. I mean, I was just kind of saying, oh, come on, you guys, you know. And I would mock them a little bit. We would laugh. But my wife would stand there and she would listen to them and she would nod and say, oh, okay. Hmm. And she would listen to them and take it all in, at least they thought. And as soon as they go, they would go, my wife would turn to me and say, why do they have to keep coming here all the time and bringing their religion? And so we found out after we got saved that the whole community was, were talking about us. And they were saying, you know what, John, he'll never get saved. He is so hard and against the gospel, he'll never get saved. But Coral, Coral, you guys say, as in reef and ocean, by the way. My wife, Coral, they said, you know what? She's about to get saved any day. What they didn't know is that my wife was like the Antichrist. <laughs> but I, on the other hand, Every time they would come and witness to me, although I'd mock them, I was like a candle on a birthday cake. You ever know how fast a candle melts on a birthday cake? That was me. They had no idea the effect and the power their words were having on me and, of course, my wife eventually as well. The Antichrist did get saved. Thank God for that. Now, here is Jacob. He's been blessed. Let's remember the birthright was sold to him in chapter 25, 33. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. But there's no immediate result. There's no tangible effect of uh, these words having been spoken over his life. And again, when his father Isaac speaks the blessing, is tricked into speaking the blessing of the firstborn over Jacob's life, uh, there is no blessing. And herein lay the danger. Because we see no immediate effect, we can discount the power of our words. For Jacob, it seems even worse because he leaves his father's house empty-handed. Now, I never thought about this until I was actually preparing this sermon. But it dawned on me as I read the text of that when Jacob left his father's house, he didn't leave like the prodigal son loaded up with goods. He left practically empty-handed with nothing more than the blessing. He didn't have an entourage of servants and, and people carrying his goods. And he didn't have any of that. But Jacob leaves his father's house with nothing. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me. Genesis 28, verse 11. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place and went to sleep. This is his first night away from home. He's on his way to Uncle Laban's house. And the Bible says he doesn't even have a pillow. He uses a rock for a pillow. Now, I was a missionary for nearly 15 years in the Fiji Islands, and, and I learned how to live without a lot of things. But I always enjoyed having a pillow to lay my head on. But Jacob didn't even have that. Jacob leaves his father's house with nothing. Well, what about the blessing of the birthright? What about the blessing of his father's father Isaac, the fatness of the earth, plenty of grain and wine, people to serve you, nations to bow down to you? What happened to all of this? You see, the danger is, is that we lose sight of the promise of the blessing. The birthright, and the blessing of Jacob were not immediate guarantees, but they were the promise of a future in God. 
and your life is filled with the promises of a future in God. Have you ever received the word? Prophecy over your life. Do you believe it? Where is it? We're blessed, but empty handed. Allow me to take it just a little further. What are you personally speaking over your life right now? Maybe you're married. What are you saying about your marriage? What are you saying about your family, your children? What are you saying about your finances? What are you saying about your calling in God? your ministry, your future. What are you saying about life right now? You see, you've been given great promises and precious promises, but your words can either bless or curse everything that God wants to do in your life. You may look at your life right now and say, you know what, I'm empty-handed without blessing. But God isn't finished with you yet. So let's think about when the future arrives. God's promises have an arrival date in your life. You know what? I began to pray. People often ask me, how long have you been saved? And I say, well, how old are you? I'm this, this old or that old. And I say, well, I got saved about 50 more. I began praying. Saying, God, well, you know, I've, I've tithed, I've given offerings, I've tried to do my entire Christian life. And I began to lay a hold of God and say, Lord, your word says that if I will be faithful in the tithe and the offering, that you will open up the windows of heaven and you will pour out such blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. And I began to pray and say, God, you've, you've blessed me, you've helped me. You've no doubt had your hand upon our lives, but I have never seen that, and you've invited me to put you to the test here. So I began to pray, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for about 18 months. God, when are the windows of heaven going to open over my life? You've said I'm blessed. But where is the blessing? Well, God's promises have an arrival date in your life. And here's the real challenge. You've got to outlive all the things that that want to steal the blessing from your life. Have you ever had a word spoken over your life? Do you believe it? God heard every word that was spoken over Jacob's life. He heard the words of Esau. When he sold his birthright, he heard the words of Jacob when he spoke the blessing of the firstborn upon him. And God hears the words of blessing and hope and prosperity and abundance that are spoken over your life. But God's promises have an arrival date in your life. And what you've got to understand is that it isn't affected by outward influences of the circumstances you find yourself in. It can be affected by the words you speak. You can begin to work against the blessing of God over your life by speaking yourself out of the blessing. Jacob found himself in some very adverse and difficult conditions of opposition. And it was in these very conditions that God was able to bless him. God doesn't bless us because of our circumstances, but many times God blesses us in spite of our circumstances. That's the way God works. In spite of cheating Laban, Jacob was abundantly blessed. Genesis 31 verse 7, your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times, but God didn't allow him to hurt me. Jacob has a powerful revelation here, a realization 
of who and what God is. But God did not allow the adverse circumstance of his life to rob him of blessing. In fact, Laban himself recognizes, I have been blessed because of Jacob. Let me ask you, what has God said about your life? As we look at Jacob, his future blessing has now arrived. If you've still got your Bible open, turn it to Genesis 32 verse 10, where we read the final outcome. This is the fourth picture of what's happening in Jacob's life. Listen to what Jacob says. He's speaking here to God. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Listen to what he says. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, with a stick, and now I've become two companies. He's going to meet Esau, and he has to split all of his goods up into two companies, two groups, because there is such a massive amount of wealth and resources that has now, over a period of time, been poured out on the life of Jacob. Crosses over the Jordan with only staff, using a stone for a pillow, blessed but empty-handed. But his future blessing has now arrived. I want to say to this, this to you, that your future blessing will also arrive. You may not see the evidence of it yet, but God says what you say is what you get. What are you saying about your life right now? Are you laying claim personally to the blessing and favor of God over your life? Or do you give a voice to every negative feeling and emotion you have you know what just because you have a negative thought or a negative emotion doesn't mean you've got to speak it out you may be feeling horribly depressed can i give you some good advice if you can't say anything that is filled with faith zip it don't say anything because god is listening to everything do the promises the words are that you might have received, the prophecies you've received in the past, they fill you with hope. God is going to bless you. You've got to understand that even though you may be empty-handed now, God has promised a blessing that will someday arrive in your life. You know, as I said, I began praying and saying, God, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that blessing that you've spoken. long, long time. And after the answer, I, I must admit, I was actually asking God for a certain amount of cash. And after 18 months, I have to be honest with you, it didn't come in. That's the simple truth. The amount I prayed for didn't come in. But what did happen is God brought in more than twice as much what I was praying for because God heard my words every prayer ascended to the very throne of grace that you are encouraged to boldly come to and I want to encourage you this morning as we start these series of revival meetings what you say not only here in church but in your vehicle as you're driving home while you're in your home with your family, what you say matters. Because what you say is absolutely, positively what you'll get. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you will. test the pastor here talked about the power of words when you read the bible god's words were very very powerful 
beginning Genesis. That's how he created everything. He spoke it. And as you read the New Testament, Jesus, God in the flesh, by a word, he casted out demons. By a word, people were healed and sins were forgiven. His words have power. They carry weight. And the pastor says that even our own words are powerful and carry weight also. But there's no more powerful or greater words than the ones we can speak than the words we say, God, save me. As Peter was sinking, those are the words he uttered. And when he said that, the hand of God reached down and saved him from uh, sinking. And I'm telling you, there's no greater words than we can speak than those same words. God, save me. God, forgive me of my sins. Because the Bible says that you and I are sinners. And the Bible says sinners are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But by simple words, that can change. You can go from hearing the words of being condemned to a place of torment for eternity to hearing the words, you are forgiven. As the Bible says, when we cry out to God, he will save us. When you're in this place, you have no relationship with God. You're living in sin. I want to tell you, you're, you're going down the wrong path. And this world is full of words. You hear it in the news. They bring fear. They, they will cause you to worry and get your eyes off of Christ and put it on this world. And I'm telling you, in this world, you're not going to have any hope. If you're thinking, man, somebody's going to get into that presidency and it's going to save us, I'm telling you, you're very wrong. Because the only one that can truly save is Jesus Christ. And his help, his salvation can come to your life. And in my life, that way it came in 2012, when I cried out to him those words, God, save me. God, forgive me of my sins. I want every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. This is an open opportunity to those that don't know Christ. You have no relationship with him. You don't know him personally. That can change. This place you can leave having a relationship with Christ, knowing the true living Savior, the one that created everything. The one that died on the cross for you and I shed his blood for your sins to pay for them. You can know him. And it's by simply uttering those simple words, God, save me. Maybe you're in this place, you're backslidden, you knew God at one time. You were serving God. I mean, your heart was surrendered, but something happened. You turned away from God. You went back into the world and you're lost again. But that can change. That can change just like that. Just those simple words. God, I am sorry, God. I turn back to you. God, forgive me. If that is you, you're unsaved or backslidden in your heart. Just simply raise your hand. You're unsaved. You don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Raise your hand. That can change tonight. Tonight, you can have an encounter with the living God. That is you. Simply raise your hand. Backslidden in this place. Your destiny can change tonight. Simply raising your hand, receiving Christ as Savior, coming back to Him. That is you in this place. Simply raise your hand. brother and sister in this place pastor spoke about the power of our, of our words and we know that let me ask you what words have you been speaking in your life what words have you been speaking in those times of difficulty but also the blessing of speaking things in faith I want to open up these altars these altars are open. You can come to the front, get a hold of God. As our brother here is going to help us worship God. So the Lord. Hallelujah. 
His glory, glory, exalted high. Trade of his robe, fill the temple, and the angel circle around him and cry. It's not too late. The grace of God is here waiting for you. That is you. It's okay. You can come to the front. Cry out to God. Holy Lord of stand in this place let's worship God with our brother in this place let's stand in this place as the angels cry lift your hands in this place let's worship the living God Sing it out. Your name. Hallelujah. We're going to be dismissed this evening. Please don't forget on Saturday morning prayer at nine. And then we're meeting back here uh, in time to leave by 530 to help our brother in Eloy. If you have any questions, uh, you can get with me. I can help you out with that. Don't forget the ministries that are happening. Live again on Monday and also the Prescott Men's Discipleship. And don't forget the uh, Donuts and Discipleship on Sunday. Everything that is going on and happening this week, please remember. That way we can get involved and we can help out in the kingdom of God. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if our brother Emilio can uh, uh, close in, in prayer. Amen. God bless you as you go tonight.